Your city might have spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to improve your commute, yet somehow managed to make it worse. That six-lane highway cutting through downtown, the endless traffic snarls, the neighborhoods torn apart by concrete barriers, none of this happened by accident. Much of it is the result of something called strategic planning gone wrong. Strategic planning is supposed to be the long-term vision that shapes the future of a city. It comes in the form of 30-year master plans and policy frameworks that decide everything from where housing will be built to how transportation networks evolve. In theory, it should create cities that are more livable, efficient, and resilient. But in practice, many cities treat planning like a video game, laying out grand visions without fully understanding how neighborhoods actually grow or what residents truly need. They make promises to revitalize downtown or transform the economy, but rarely follow through with the difficult, sometimes unpopular steps needed to make it work. Some cities get it right. Take Copenhagen, for example. When they announced their 2025 goal to become carbon neutral, they did not stop at lofty speeches or attractive policy documents. They invested in bike lanes before they were crowded, built renewable energy systems before the crisis became urgent, and coordinated housing, transportation, and environmental policy in one unified effort. That is strategic planning at its best proactive, forward-looking and courageous. Compare that to cities that focus only on what looks good on paper. They wait until crises hit, then scramble with half measures. The difference is political courage, being willing to make tough decisions today so that tomorrow actually works. Why walking feels impossible if you live in a suburb where every errand requires a car? Land use planning is the culprit. Land use planning is essentially the rule book of a city, dictating where houses can go, where businesses can be built, and how land is divided among different uses. In much of the United States, this takes the form of Euclidean zoning, a rigid system that separates residential, commercial, and industrial areas into completely different zones. That is why your house might be miles away from the nearest grocery store. It is why office parks sit surrounded by oceans of parking, and why strip malls line highways with no safe way to reach them on foot. This type of planning systematically creates car dependency. Contrast that with Tokyo, where mixed-use zoning dominates. In the same block, you might find apartments, restaurants, small shops, and offices stacked seamlessly together. Daily life becomes easier because everything is within walking distance. In American cities, zoning laws often make that illegal. About three quarters of urban land in the US is locked into single-family zoning, which not only drives up housing costs, but also makes sustainable transportation nearly impossible. The results are staggering. Americans spend more than a quarter of their income just on transportation, compared to only 8% in walkable mixed-use cities. Land use policy does not just decide where buildings go, it shapes the cost of living, the environment, and even how much free time people have left after endless commute. The DNA of a city, while land use planning decides what goes where, master planning integrates it all into a big picture design. It is the blueprint that is supposed to make transportation, housing park, and infrastructure work together in harmony. Done well, it transforms cities into places where people want to live and thrive. Barcelona offers one of the best examples of effective master planning with its famous superblock. The city grouped nine traditional blocks together, banned through traffic inside them, and turned into sections into plazas filled with greenery and public space. The results were dramatic, noise pollution dropped by 70%, air pollution declined by more than 20%, and green space increased by nearly a third. The city became more walkable, more vibrant, and healthier, all thanks to coordinated planning. By contrast, many cities in the US have spaghetti bowl master plans. Highways slice through neighborhoods with little regard for community connections. Industrial zones sit uncomfortably close to schools. Transit lines fail to connect to job centers because transportation planners never coordinated with housing authorities. The lesson is simple, everything connects to everything else. When cities forget that, the design collapses, renewal or displacement. On paper, urban revitalization sounds like a noble mission, breathe life into declining neighborhoods, repair old infrastructure, and restore pride to the city. But in reality, revitalization often becomes a code word for gentrification, pushing out long-term residents to make way for luxury condos and entertainment districts. Detroit serves as a cautionary tale. For decades, leaders demolished struggling neighborhoods and poured money into flashy projects like stadiums, convention centers, and showcase development. Billions were spent, but much of the city's basic infrastructure and social fabric crumbled. The residents who needed help the most were left behind. Now compare that to Medellin, Colombia, which reinvented its approach to revitalization. 
Instead of bulldozing communities, the city built cable cars to connect impoverished hillside neighborhoods with downtown jobs. They invested in schools, libraries, and transit within the communities themselves. The results were remarkable crime dropped by 60%, property values increased, and people could afford to stay in their homes. The key difference is focus. Detroit chased outsiders, hoping new money would solve old problems. Medellin empowered insiders, making sure revitalization lifted the people already living there. One approach deepens inequality. The other builds resilience. Racing to the bottom, when you hear about a city landing a big corporate deal with tax break, you are witnessing economic development planning in act. The idea is to create jobs and attract investment, but all too often, it translates into cities handing out enormous incentives to giant corporations while small local businesses are left to drown in red tape. Some places do it differently. Singapore treated economic planning like a decades-long chess game. First, they built the world's most efficient port, which attracted logistics companies. Then they expanded into precision manufacturing, then finance, then technology. Each step built logically on the last, creating one of the strongest economies on Earth. Many cities in the US, by contrast, chase trends. They declare new tech hubs, innovation districts, or creative zones without asking whether these industries fit the skills of their workforce or the character of their economy. Politicians love the short-term ribbon cuttings, but long-term results often fail. Worse, cities compete against each other with tax giveaways, draining public revenue and creating a race to the bottom that benefits corporations but weakens communities. Living in a heat island every summer seems hotter than the last, and cities are partly to blame. Poor environmental planning has created urban heat islands, where endless asphalt and a lack of greenery push city temperatures up by as much as 8 degrees compared to surrounding areas. Combine that with flooding from inadequate drainage and the costs quickly reach billions. Some cities take the issue seriously. Copenhagen planted trees strategically to cool neighborhoods and absorb stormwater. They added green roofs that cut energy costs by up to 30%. Melbourne created green corridors, connecting parks and rivers into a citywide network that functions as a set of urban lungs. These efforts do not just help the environment, they save lives and prevent expensive disasters. Meanwhile, other cities slash tree budgets to widen highways, only to wonder later why summers feel unbearable and flash floods keep damaging property. Environmental planning is not about being idealistic. It is about preventing future crises that will cost far more than proactive action today. Invisible until it breaks, good infrastructure is like oxygen. You do not notice it until it is gone. Infrastructure planning is the careful coordination of transportation systems, utilities and essential services. When it works, life runs smoothly. When it fails, the results can be catastrophic. Consider the collapse of Texas's power grid during a severe winter storm. Without backup systems, without proper weather proofing, and without coordination between providers, millions were left freezing in the dark, more than 700 people died, and damages soared past 50 D billion. That is the price of failing to plan for the future. Contrast that with the Netherlands, where infrastructure is designed with climate change in mind. Their water management systems not only defend against floods, but also generate clean energy. They assume the worst case scenario and build accordingly. Many American systems, however, still operate with pipes, bridges, and electrical grids designed in the mid-20th century, long before today's demands. It is no wonder bridges collapse and water systems fail. Infrastructure planning requires thinking 50 years ahead. Unfortunately, most political systems only think two years ahead to the next election. Human scale vis car scale, finally. There is urban design, the human scale elements that make a city feel alive. Sidewalk, plazas, public spaces, and streetscapes are not just decorative. They determine whether people actually want to spend time outside, connect with neighbors, and support local businesses. Walk through Copenhagen or Amsterdam, and you will find sidewalks wide enough for crowds, bike lanes safe enough for children, and places to sit every hundred feet. The streets are not just corridors for movement, they are spaces to live in. That is good design. Now compare that to a typical downtown in North America. Narrow sidewalks squeeze pedestrians into single file. There is no shade, no resting spots, and few reasons to linger. Streets roar with traffic, and vast parking lots swallow land where housing or parks could exist. The built environment sends a clear message this place is for cars, not for people. The good news is that cities can change. Policies can be rewritten. Land use can be reformed. Streets can be redesigned for people instead of cars. The bad news is that this rarely happens unless citizens push for it. Political will follows public pressure. So the question is which planning decision has hurt your city the most?